We're going to be talking about the last of the fruits of the Spirit uh, in Galatians 5, starting in verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we're all the way down. Yeah, everybody cringes. It's kind of like patience. Yeah, we could talk about something else. What did you say? Self-control. Self-control. I, my body has more self-control than my mouth does. I'm afraid my mouth is a little lagging on that one. Um, I've wondered if the fact that it's listed last has anything to do with its difficulty. I mean, our human side, our physical nature, uh, they don't lend themselves to being self-controlled. But I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about what self-control is not before we get into what I think it is. It, it's a little too easy to define self-control as simply following the rules, right? A list of don't do this, don't do that. And so if I don't do this, then I'm self-controlled. Think about overeating or over drinking or uh, you know whatever your vice might be and that somehow by not doing those things that that equals self-control uh, I think there's there's a happy medium to be found and I, I hope we can kind of settle into it here in a minute uh, first of all self-control is not law keeping not law control look at Galatians 5 verse 1 Galatians 5, verse 1, same chapter. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised, he is obligated to obey the whole law. You are trying to be justified by the law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. It's the only place in the New Testament that phrase happens, fallen from grace. And it's in a context not like for me growing up, I thought of falling from grace as not keeping the law well enough. Paul says if you try to base your salvation on how well you keep the law, you have fallen from grace. You have to choose. Either it's by God's grace that you're saved through Jesus, or it's by your own effort. You can't have both. And so in this passage anyway, he says, uh, you who seek to be justified by the law, you've been alienated from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. Through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And so there's Paul's take on what salvation is all about. It's by grace through faith. And if we try to achieve it by ourselves, we at least run the risk of stepping aside from God's grace and trying to earn it ourselves. We've fallen from grace. So self-control isn't just about keeping the law, about doing things the right way. None of us ever could, right? When, um, when Paul and Barnabas go to Jerusalem to talk about the circumcision question, one of the things that the apostles and elders there in Jerusalem bring up is, why would we hang a, a set of regulations on them that we can't keep? Uh, why do we want to impose that kind of headache, heartache uh, on these new converts when it's by grace that we're all saved through Christ. So it's not about law control. But it's also not about simply being self-serving. The current definition of self-control has a lot more to do with self-motivation and uh, becoming our best self, living my best life. So if I turn aside from eating too much, it's not because that glorifies God. It's because, you know, I want to look better and then people will look at me and, and like the way I look. Uh, if I give up smoking, it's so people will say, oh, well, you've made a good healthy choice and, you know, good for you. So it, it's more self-centered and self-control 
biblically is not about being self-centered. There's a, that's interesting to me anyway, uh, part of the story of Pandora's box. The Greek word for wisdom is sophos. And so there is a demon, a, a being that comes out of Pandora's box, but it's a good one. And its name is Sophrosine. And Sophrosine is that being that helps you have self-control. So it's wise. Sophrosine. That's the way I'm saying it anyway, uh, because you don't know any better. Sophrosine. Uh, and her claim to fame is that she helped people be more in control of themselves. So she was a self-control being. Anyway, uh, but it comes from the same kind of idea as uh, self-control. But again, we're not talking about some demonic thing that came out of Pandora's box and just overwhelms us and makes us live a certain way. Uh, I think what Paul means when he said that the Holy Spirit provides self-control as a fruit of the Spirit is that it is something to do with being spirit-led, right? It is a fruit of the Spirit, and being God-led. So when we make these decisions to do something or not do something, it's directly related to our faith, not just surrounding circumstances, right? I want to be skinnier so I don't eat as much. That's nice, but there's so much more that it could be, right? When people notice that you've, You've lost 30 pounds. Is it time to say, well, look at me, I'm so self-controlled? Or is it time to say, well, I thank God that, that I've been able to do this. He's helped me to get through this circumstances. Well, I was an alcoholic for X number of years. I went to rehab, and I came out of rehab, and now I'm clean, and I've been clean and sober for five years. Who should we praise for that? Do we just praise the individual for their self-control? It's there. It's necessary. But there's something higher, something more important than just what they're able to accomplish because of their self-control. So I want to use the terms God-controlled or spirit-controlled. But again, I want to make that designation between law-controlled and God-controlled. Right? Yes, God wrote the law. Yes, people that keep the law or kept the law were trying to control themselves, at least having a relationship with God. But I want us, in, in terms of what Paul is talking about, to think about God control alongside our self-control. I want to look at two or three things that Jesus did that are worthy of note and, and help us to understand maybe what we might be able to do. Look at Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Were there times that Jesus was less self-controlled? See, it would be easy to jump over to cleansing the temple, right? He, he, he wasn't about self-control that day. People might have uh, felt like he wasn't holding on to himself as well as he might have. But was he God-controlled? Oh, yeah, every bit God controlled, right? So his self-control and his God control intermingled. So he made the right decision to do the right thing. But outsiders would not have looked at him and gone, oh, what a self-controlled thing to do. Uh, chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now notice, we've, we've been talking about some of these guys uh, on Sunday morning as we, we study uh, the Gospel of John. John the Baptist has been assassinated by now. Right? So John's dead. Herod thinks that Jesus is John the Baptist uh, come back from the dead. He's a little afraid of Jesus at this point because he thinks that that Jesus is supernatural. Some say Elijah, right? They were still waiting for Elijah to return. He didn't die his first time around. He got taken up into heaven in the, in the chariot. So maybe this is Elijah coming back and Jesus isn't Messiah. Maybe he's the forerunner of Messiah. So they have all kinds of opinions about who Jesus is. But what about you, Jesus asked? Who do you say I am? 
And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Now verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Okay, is there any self-control going on here? Self-control, spirit control, God control. He has a mission, and he's going to hang on to that mission. Notice, this is the passage where Peter tries to stop him. Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns. So whatever Peter was looking for in Jesus, he was wanting Jesus to exhibit a self-control that had something to do with self-preservation or with uh, self-advertising, but not, I'm the Messiah, so I'm going to go to Jerusalem and die. So Peter is a close friend, a close associate. Uh, upon this rock I will build my church. But then the next thing we have recorded is get behind me, Satan, because Jesus is under the control of God. Right? Not to the point that he couldn't have decided otherwise, but his self-control was based in spirit control, based in God's control. Uh, we won't go over and read it, but Luke gives us an account in chapter 9 that says when it was time for him to be received up, he set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. So he was tunnel visioned toward going to the cross. He knew early on in his ministry exactly what was going to happen to him. And occasionally he shared that information with the disciples, not so much with other people, but with his disciples. And they never really understood it. But Jesus never let them or their opinions or their thoughts get in his way because he was on God's time. He was God-controlled, spirit-controlled, uh, not just self-controlled. Uh, he didn't let fear get in the way of the spirit control, the God control. Uh, think about the Last Supper. He has all 12 of them at the table, and he's going around washing their feet. How many of them at the table know that by that time the next evening he would have died? None of them. Right? Uh, so he washes Peter's feet. Peter's like, oh, don't wash my feet. Uh, you know, I should be washing yours. And Jesus says, well, if I don't wash your feet, you can't have anything to do with me. Peter's like, oh, well, then wash my face, wash my hands, you know, wash all of me. Uh, there was always that impulsiveness because Peter didn't know the plan. Jesus knew the plan, and just steadfast. He's headed toward the cross, and he knows it, and he never lets that stop him. Uh, later on the same night, he goes to the garden, and he leaves, uh, it would have been, uh, I guess, eight of the disciples in one place, and then Peter, James, and John go with him on a little bit farther in the garden, and he says, okay, you guys wait here. And he goes over and he just falls down on his face and talks to the Father. What's the question? Can we do this another way? Right? If there's any other way, then let's do that. But if not, not my will, but your will be done. Right? So the will of the Father is more important than the will of the Son. The self-control of the Spirit and Jesus' self-control working together through all of these things. He's hanging on the cross. Well, I want to throw Judas in there too. Just throw him under the bus. Judas comes up the hill and kisses him. And Jesus says, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Why didn't he just belt him? Right? You're not going to get crucified anymore 
than what you're already going to get crucified. But he doesn't. He, he allows himself to go through all of the pain, even allowing people to, to get by who shouldn't have gotten by. Hanging on the cross, uh, soldiers, passers-by, laughing, joking. Uh, you know, if, if you're really the Messiah, come down and we'll believe in you. Oh, he's calling out for Elijah. Let's see if Elijah comes and gets him. Uh, all that stuff. And he had all the power in the universe at his disposal. Self-control, spirit control, God control. Uh, he, he never gave anyone else the remote. I think that's one of my favorite illustrations I've ever heard. I was at a, a college uh, retreat. I think might have been a youth rally. But anyway, the, the speaker just kept going on and on about any time you let somebody else push your buttons and decide for you whether you're going to be angry or, or sad or happy or lonely or whatever, if you let somebody else be in charge of that, then you're nuts. You have to be in charge of your own remote. Don't let anybody else have your remote control. Uh, Jesus did. Jesus was completely in control of himself and his surroundings through the entirety of his passion. So uh, it's it gives us a lesson to look at. You know, what can we do in response to how Jesus handled his relationship with the world? Right? Let the world do whatever the world's going to do. But if we are controlled by the Spirit and God and our spirit being in sync, self-control, spirit control, father control, then we can be useful to the kingdom. We can do something that's that's lasting and maybe make an impression on other people around us. Back to Galatians chapter 5 and just kind of wrap up the whole thing. He ends that list, right? Gentleness and self-control. Against such there is no law. When people see you living like this, nobody should be offended by the fact that you're kind or peaceful or joyful. You know, these are not things that immediately back people into a corner and make them say, well, I don't want to be around that bunch because they're too nice. Uh, they've, they've got too much peaceful attitude about them. They're, they're too loving. They're too patient. I just can't stand patient people. Uh, you, you just don't run into that. So he says there's no laws against those things. But those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking or envying each other. So again, my personal control, my self-control is in step with the Spirit's control, in step with the Father's control. We could even put Jesus in there in, in step with our Lord's control, with His example, with His um, influence in our lives. He is our older brother, and it's really, really nice when somebody sees the family resemblance, when they can say, you must be a Christian because only a Christian would act like that. You could have done anything in that situation, but I can see Jesus all over you the way you responded to that person or that event. Or the, you know, It's always great to, to have that uh, imprint of your older brother on you. So may that be true of all of us.